Hopefully I can get it right this time. How's it going everyone? Cody Bernardi here with another YouTube video and in today's video I want to talk about some things that you should know or might want to know to make yourself stand out from the others when searching for jobs in cybersecurity. Now everything I'm talking about in this video is my personal opinion. This might not apply to you or the businesses that you're applying to. However, there's a lot of businesses that have to follow some of these guidelines and you just knowing just a tiny bit of what I'm going to be presenting, I guess, in this video will make you stand out from the crowd a lot. And what I'm talking about today are standards that businesses have to follow to do businesses to do business with certain entities. So without further ado, I'm going to get into the video after you hit the like button on this video. So the first thing that I want to talk about is NIST standards. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what NIST is, NIST runs NVD and NVD issues out CVE numbers, which is the number associated with the vulnerability. So you'll have like things like CVE 2019-19781. And that number is associated with the ah. tricks vulnerability back in December of last year that I had to deal with. Fun stuff. And you have things like WannaCry, that was MS-17010, and that was CVE-2017, blah, blah, blah. You get the point. That's what NIST does. And NVD, National Vulnerability Database, is what that is. And NIST puts out certain frameworks and guidance for businesses to follow for the best cybersecurity hygiene. And you knowing some of these portions of their releases will definitely make you stand out from the crowd because I can tell you, you might work at a place right now that requires a password rotation every 30, 60, or 90 days. What if I told you NIST told you that that is complete BS and you should not be doing that at all? So you just knowing that password rotations without identifier of breach is a little silly and it actually makes your security a little, little weaker. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about <clears throat> is NIST Cybersecurity Framework version 1. And you can go here and they make it so easy for you that all you have to do is download the PDF and you just read through it. And knowing certain portions of uh, the Cybersecurity Framework version 1 or you know whatever version they come out with at the time will definitely make you stand out from the crowd. And it's a, it's a nice talking point, at least in your interview. And then when you get the job, being able to go off of that and mimic what the government's guidance is it's definitely going to make you go up the chain a lot faster as far as promotions go. Moving on, we have ISO 27000. Now, this is the set of standards issued for cybersecurity, and ISO is the International Standards Organization, I believe, um, or International Organization of, for Standardization. So you'll have ISO codes in aerospace and blah, 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 blah. But the 27,000 series is specific to information security and they'll have their own separate domains. So just being able to go through that, and you, actually, you can actually see it right here. So you'll have monitoring, measurement, analysis, and evaluation, ISO 27,004, and so on and so forth. So whatever the job is, I would say spend a little bit of time on that ISO code um, and just read into it a little bit more and talk about it and then maybe put it in your resume just a little bit. Next up, we have the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And now this is everything that a, an offensive security engineer should know, or at least be familiar with the ATT&CK framework, as well as blue teams, especially if you're on incident response and hunt. You'll be going and trying to find TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures of what a uh, malicious person would do, and you'd build countermeasures to that. So this is the ATT&CK framework by MITRE. I'll put a link to all of this down below. Next up, this is a brand new one, and I, I don't expect any of my subscribers to know about this, but if you work for a DOD uh, contractor, so if you are doing business with the DOD, Department of Defense, you have to get a CMMC certification fairly soon. Depending if your contract states it uh, right now, so if you're bidding on a contract and it says you need to meet CMMC level one, two, three, four, five, whatever, you're gonna have to pay a third party for, for them to certify you that you meet those standards before you can even 
start the contract, before you can even bid on the contract, as far as I know. This is something that I'm personally going after. I want to be a third-party auditor for the CMMC, so this is brand new. So if you work at a very large contracting firm and you do business with the DoD, CMMC, this is something that should be right up your alley. And if you're applying to positions that is like Booz Allen Hamilton, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, etc., the list goes on and on, they will have to be CMMC compliant within a few months. So understanding what you need for CMMC compliance, oh boy, that, that's going to make you stand out. Next up is PCI. This one is generic. Everyone kind of knows about it, I guess. PCI is Payment Card Industry. I believe that's what it stands for. Basically, if your business takes in payments and they process payments themselves, they have to be PCI compliant. So if you want to take in Visa transactions, Amex transactions, MasterCard transactions, Diners Club transactions, you have to be PCI compliant. And that means that any vulnerabilities that are PCI related have to be patched when the third party auditor comes in and does an assessment. And if you have a vulnerability scanning software solution like Qualys or Tenable or Rapid7, which if you process payment card stuff, you should probably have one of those. Um, it will say in the vulnerability details that this is PCI um, related and you have to mitigate the vulnerability. So typically anything SSL related, so if it's like a, a poodle attack, that's an old SSL downgrading attack, that's a PCI vulnerability. You have to be compliant and you have to mitigate that vulnerability. You can't just push it off. If you're, if you're a, what's it called? PCI auditor. If you're a, your QSA, your QSA qualified security assessor comes on and does an audit and someone's frying burnt steak on their stove. If they come on and see all of these PCI vulnerabilities, you are not going to pass your PCI audit. Thus, I think you have like 30 days to fix any vulnerabilities. And if you don't pass that, you can't take in payment cards and that's going to stop your business from taking in Visa, MasterCard, Amex, etc. payments. So just keep that in mind. PCI, that's like a niche area that not a lot of people know or focus on, but if you can focus on that, it's gonna make you stand out. Now, I just want to clarify something real quick. If your business takes in payment cards via things like PayPal, Stripe, um, and Square, you do not need to get a PCI audit if that is your only means of taking in payment. That's because these businesses actually get their own audits, thus meaning you don't need to get it because they're the ones that are keeping financial records. That's what PCI is protecting. It's the, the uh, files and uh, associations of credit cards and names, etc., that is what PCI is looking to protect. And that is in the hands of these payment card processors such as Square, PayPal, Stripe, etc. So if you work at a restaurant and that's what you use, you do not need to get a PCI audit on with the video. So NIST 853. So that is the publication that I am referring to. So the NIST special publication 853, again, like I said, links to all of this down below. They're currently on their fifth revision and it includes things like uh, privacy con or security and privacy controls, password requirements, multi-factor authentication, things like that. So basically what I'm getting at into this video is there are certain things that your business, if not already doing, bringing it up to, to management right now will make you stand out because it's what the government's pushing out. And it's like, okay, the government recommends that you don't change your passwords every 90 days. We currently do that, and here's the reason why. We don't have multi-factor authentication. This is the reason why we should have that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could go down these publications and read all about it. And you know what? It, I, I hope people take it seriously as far as your management goes and all that. And then also just a cherry on top, there's a couple of organizations that you should be familiar with that will help you out as well. So NVD, NIST NVD is one of them. They are the ones that issue out CVEs. Another one is CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which falls under the Department of Homeland Security, and they deal with triaging vulnerabilities. They run US CERT, so United States Computer Emergency Response Team, and ICS cert, 
industrial control systems computer response team uh, first so that's another organization that handles cves miter m-i-t-e m-i-t-r-e so miter is another one um, and then you have nsa cyber army cyber like these other organizations government organizations that are entwined in cyber and they have a lot of publications how to do business and all that so anyways that is it for this video if you guys enjoy content like this this one was probably very boring it's very policy related um, if you if if this is not something you like, then I would still encourage you to uh, demolish the like button and subscribe button. But this one was pretty boring, so I don't blame you if you didn't watch the video all the way through. Unless you're watching it right now, you probably did. Anyways, that's it for this video. Y'all take care. Goodbye. Security teams actually are now in a position where we've got to do more of like a vertical scaling. In other words, we've got to expand our capacity dynamically and automatically as we instantiate the triggered operations that led to the scaling in the first place. So maybe the point being, we have to scale too. So we've not only got to know what's going on in the scaling, but we've got to be able to scale accordingly at the same time so that we're not choking or throttling the environment. Um, this is a pretty easy one in terms of just core design concepts.